spent two hundred and eighty dollars on burgundy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. What and, I, and it was worth it. Lesson two. You should not run a university. Right. <laughs> so it's 101, week two. Uh, I agree. <laughs> this semester we're doing some real basic stuff. Uh, we started with white wines last week. This time we're going to be talking about some red wines. Um, now, as I said, I've got a very uh, a dated anecdotal view on white and red wines in the sense that whites are for girls, reds are for boys, because that's what I grew up with, mum and dad serving them wines. She was always yep. drinking whites, dad was always drinking reds. Yeah. When I think about red wine, I think of old men, I think mm -hmm. of my face screwing up as a 17 year old being told totally. to try wines at the family dinner table that were being paired with really big heavy meals. Uh, totally. Yeah. I think cool. uh, I spent a lot of time at um, uh, Bleasdale wineries as a kid doing some like bottling and stuff. Dope like winery that. though. It's oh, incredible. It's pretty cool. Pretty dope winery. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we don't need to get into it, but Dad's got a bunch of connections there. Um, <laughs> don't need to get into it. Uh, so I think when I think red wine, I think Shiraz. I yep. think Pinot Noir. I yep. think Cabernet. Yep. I think Merlot. Cool. Yep. And I also think rosé, but we're probably not including that in red we'll wine. Leave rose we'll leave rosé. An... Yeah, rosé right. is another we'll big we'll conversation. We'll do another week on that. Sweet. So talk to me about. Let's start out with the big ones. So let's start out with your Shiraz. Like that's the I, heavy. Is that your let's, heavy? Let's, let's big... go. Let's go. Let's go back a little bit. Okay. So, so red wine, masculine. That's just bullshit. That's just. Yep. Uh, that's just like a word association thing from like how you've grown up, which no one's yes. blaming you for. But it's just. It's that's a classic Australian. It's just like thing. Yeah. It's it's just. So don't don't even think about that. Don't even like worry about that. Anyone can enjoy amazing red wine, and red wine has a amazing spectrum, right? From you know, really rich, dense, and heavy, and it gets heavier than Cabernet. It gets heavier than Shiraz. Oh like God. that's got nothing on Argentinian Malbec, for example. Alianico or, or Saparavi. Like it goes yeah. harder than that, right? And then on the opposite end, it can go so light as to start to question whether or not it's it's even rosé. So you've got the full you've got a full spectrum of deliciousness. In Australia, of course, we know Shiraz. It's actually Syrah is the great variety. It's colloquialism that we sort of call it Shiraz. So is it only in Australia that's called Shiraz? It was popularised. It's actually now, believe it or not, being utilised by South African and American producers to be able to more accurately describe a style, and that style is... I really, I really enjoy when you throw prefaces like believe it or not in front of something like that when you're talking to me about wine, and I'm like, <laughs> wow, I literally can't believe that the South... Surprise! <laughs> wow, yeah. That, I, I, so, yeah, yeah, Shiraz was first popularised and kind of coined, I guess, in Australia. I believe it was McLaren Vale, and I believe it was, it was uh, Immigrants. Yep. That's because because there is a town. I think there is a town called Shiraz that is in uh, sort of old old world Persia. Yeah. Um, uh, that has nothing to do with this. Well, yeah. There was a belief that um, Shiraz was actually from old school uh, Persia. Persia. Most, um, most uh, grape varieties technically were around uh, there. They they did. I think DNA people found out. DNA people uh, <laughs> discovered <laughs> that it's called, actually. Aren't they called scientists? <laughs> <laughs> I mean the DNA I mean, I'm, scientists. I'm gonna go with DNA. People. That's <laughs> sick. Um, but they found out that um, Shiraz is actually a cross between Mondus and something else in uh, oh, Loire, wow. uh, in Rhone Valley. It's it's a Rhone Valley grape. It's yeah. it's a cross between Mondus yeah. and something else. Maybe I can't remember. Ancestry.com on Shiraz, essentially. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> cool. Uh, yeah. Well, while we're talking about yeah. it, so let's start out with. Look, I know that you said that there's heavier ones. There's some yeah. Argentinian Malbec. Yeah, let's, like, like, yeah, let's talk about Shiraz. Shiraz. Let's go Shiraz. 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 difference between Shiraz and Syrah. Shiraz is probably more indicative of hot climate. Big, heavy, extracted, like your dad's wine is probably the the most common way to describe it. Non-gendered though. Non-gendered. Your your parents' wine. Um, yeah. And then Syrah is a bit more lighter, prettier, white pepper. And you know, is, all those kind of like a word association that's really come about because of climatic differences. Mm -hmm. It's so same grape variety. We've taken it from a cold place, put it in a warm place, and naturally the warm place is going to be showcasing more overripe characters that you we would associate from the cold place. So that that's a word association that because we changed the word of it and we yep. marketed this concept as a country uh, and an industry, um, now people associate Shiraz with big, and it is to be honest for you know as you know. As a, as a consumer that's entering the world of wine, it's complex. Un, yeah. I think unnecessarily so. But it is still an agricultural product that needs understanding. Shiraz, 
is, and the use of it in other countries kind of clarifies things a little bit, I think, for a lot of people when yep. they go, what am I in for? I personally uh, don't often opt for the bigger, richer, denser style, um, but I know sometimes I do. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I just get that craving and, you know, you get an itch, it's got to be scratched, and I know that I want to be buying something that says Shiraz on the front, not Syrah on the front, and that does help me as a consumer um, be able to navigate that yeah, a little okay. bit more. So typically, I know that we're talking about how everything, you know, we can't throw a blanket statement over everything here. Typically, when would I be looking to drink Shiraz? Like, is it something that I drink? Like, what do I drink it with? When do I drink it? How much should I pay for it? Um, I mean, to be fair, you probably get good deals in Australia. Yes, yeah. I think Shiraz is one of those things you can actually internationally, like Code to Rhone. Well, yeah. it's probably more Grenache, but uh, you can actually get some really well priced. A Shiraz yeah. from around the world? Just on that, there's actually a South African, like, uh, blend called Goats Do Roam. Uh, and it's... Oh, <laughs> honestly, it's it's also very good value. I digress. Wine joke. Uh, it's really funny if you get it. Yeah. yeah. No, no, you can actually search this up. It's a legitimate but, yeah. wine uh, That would have killed a sommelier's conference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. would have oh, killed. <laughs> God, yeah. Killed. Um, no, uh, Shiraz, I reckon you can get good value internationally, which is really cool. Um, mm -hmm. In Australia... You can probably spend between 20 to 30 bucks to get something pretty solid. I actually, like, I recently had a bottle of Pebble Jack, which is a bit of a joke wine in Australia, particularly in the wine made, industry. Like, so much of it's So made. much of it. It's every bottle shape ever. Um, had it on the couch watching in the footy in a, you know, nice little spag bowl. Nice, it was great. So typically, yeah, Shiraz, good. you do want to drink with, uh, you want to drink with meat. I, w I would just say, like, that the style Rich itself, dishes, yeah. Rich. You want to, you... And it is a decadent, hedonistic style of wine like it is big okay and big so boy. It, like it's really hard to see it either by itself it's a meal in and of itself yeah outside of that it's it does pair pretty well with so like a meat pie is a really good example of a yeah. spag bowl spaghetti bolognese it's the best those international folks when i'm doing the tastings here and i'm trying to guess how much bottles cost the heavier it is the more expensive i think it is oh, oh, and the lighter i think is cheaper but that said i think lighter reds have as much complexity I, as a heavy... I, I recall something the other week that you, watching back on the videos, because obviously for those at home, uh, we do the tastings completely like other people are actually waiting outside and it's a soundproof room, so we don't know what's going on. Not at all. So I only actually find out what you actually say about certain wines. When the when videos I, come out. When the yeah, that's great. Exactly. That's great. And, and i got to give you kudos. I haven't done this, and I'm doing it publicly for the first time ever. No, no. We so, did a video, uh, and Lockie's going to link it up, uh, and I'm pretty confident... And I'm going to ask that Lockie actually well, insert this. We can get the grab spectrum. from the video. Yeah. Grab the, get the grab <laughs> from the video because. The thing that I found is that when it's a big red, and it doesn't taste like a big red, it's generally a little bit cheaper. So I'm going to suggest that this is actually a thirty dollar bottle of wine. Uh, you, we, we were like over the moon about this particular red wine. We were over like it was it was, and we actually put the it was it was the the title of the entire video was is this the greatest you know value red wine oh yeah I oh yeah okay. yeah hundred yeah, and we were both into it we we're like man this is serious this is awesome this is fantastic and we overestimated the price of it you were the only person though that came out and were like man this smells like this but it tastes like it tastes a little bit more simple. And therefore, you actually lowballed it on price. Yeah, no, that was one of the uh, crowning moments in my career. I do remember that. <laughs> that's very an, that's a proverbial arrow in the actually, quiver. I was watching that video. I was and watch... that's impressive. That's hard to do. It's hard yeah. to be able to, in the moment, to be able to dissociate smell from taste. It's a really difficult thing. And, and that's something that I think that big wines kind of blindside you. It blindsided both of us. Mm -hmm. We overestimated that. Um, and you can actually see it in, in a lot of, like, I think that's what's really carried Shiraz or carried Cabernet as well, globally, is the smell of something. You can tell it's big, rich, it's oaky, it's dense, it looks dark, you well, know, so you give up really high This points. is something that we've spoken about off camera before when I was asking you about red wines and sort of what makes, uh, you know, like all of the, like, prestige red wines tend to be, like, bigger and heavier. And we were comparing them sort of to cars in the sense that some of the big Shirazes and the big, you know, the ones that are put in competitions and you've said that um, there is a specific way that wines are judged in competition, which is more mm. about how many features does this wine have? Like how many yeah. how many spoilers yeah. have they put on it? Like how big are the wheels? All of this stuff. So the 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 uh, the TV remote. You're just clicking the sort of volume up button on it. Crank every everything up. Yeah, yeah you're putting all the and that's sort of like saying, wow, this wine is an absolute supercar. It's a hypercar. It's your McLaren. It's your Aston Martin. It's your Ferrari. Yeah.
Do you know how hard it would be to take four kids to school in one of those cars? And that's where you're coming back to, like, these more drinkable wines that aren't necessarily yeah. impressive. Yeah. But, like, daily drinkers, do you want something that's got a 1,000 horsepower that you can never express because you're not on a racetrack? Or... Do you want something that is easy to drink? Your friends that, are all going to like. You some don't of these wines, explain it to it's them. It's actually really hard to find balance in a wine with that level of extraction. But I think we're getting off topic. We're talking about something we are. drinkable. We are. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about something that's that's drinkable. Like yep. you mentioned that. So we're talking about Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir is the, I would say, the Yin to Syrah's Yang. Agreed. In many respects. Yeah. Agreed. So Pinot, you were just saying off camera before that I think I like Pinot Noir. I do. I, th I think I might like Pinot Noir. Yeah. Hot tape. <laughs> yeah, get ready for your wallet to start look, really hurting. Look out, well, it really hurts a lot. <laughs> this is this is like breaking yeah. up marriage level. Uh, you know, obsession. You spent two hundred and eighty dollars on burgundy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. What and, I, and it was worth it. <laughs> yep. Go. Cool. Yeah, yeah, no, it's 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 nice. I had some last night. It was twenty dollars a bottle. No complaints. So yeah. well done to oh, yeah. the wine producer. I guess it's one of those things you can actually enjoy at a nice light, you know, good price point. Yeah. Just for the most part, it's refreshing. It's like more. It's versatile. You can have it in winter and summer. Um, yeah, so it's got the drinkability aspect nailed. And then for the wine nerds amongst us, it's got the other sort of aspect yeah. now where uh, it it showcases with like utter crystalline brilliance and clarity exactly where it comes from. Mm, it's amazing. And the, yeah. the layman can see it. Yeah. Anyone can see this. That Pinot Noir from somewhere like Central Otago and Pinot Noir from somewhere like, I don't know, McLaren Vale, Adelaide Hills, they taste different. That's actually all that matters is that yep. you know that they taste different. Yep. What they taste like and how you categorise them is almost irrelevant unless you want to get into the nerdy sort of aspect of it. But that's the power of Pinot. It's the power of other other red grape varieties like Nebbiolo as well. The power of Pinot. The power of Pinot compels you. It's power of <laughs> It's Brendan's self-help book. <laughs> <laughs> like well, Brendan's uh, autobiography yeah, in 20 years' time. No, no, no. No, it's, no, it's, it's going to be Brolo. It's, it's going to be Brolo. No, no. So do you know there's a word for him, though? A word for what? Word, so there are people that love Pinot and people that love Nebbiolo because they're quite, they're becoming closely associated. We call them Pinophiles and Nebophiliacs. Oh, God. Yes. Do we yes. call them that or well, do you? <laughs> I, I don't know if I'm... I, I'm, I'm with you on this one. <laughs> <laughs> this is no good. I don't know if I'm going to call someone but a Pinophile to their face. Term, <laughs> there is an industry term known as a Pinophiles and Nebophiliacs. But no, it is it is an obsession for a lot of people to, to chase the perfect Pinot. And from a winemaker's perspective, it is actually also an obsession to try to make the perfect Pinot craft of it yeah. is very hard. It's so fucking hard. It's mm. people literally just go insane <laughs> trying. Yeah. Food tastings <laughs> or porn watching? Right? What are we talking about? Yeah. Right. Cool. So we've got the light end of the spectrum and the heavy end of the spectrum. Yeah. Do you want the middle? Oh, that's That was going to be my next question. What's your middle red? You lead me. Uh, look, it depends where you are. For me, Grenache. Amen. Yeah, it's anyway. like, if we're here in Australia, like, well, I think maybe Australia produces the best value Grenache in the fucking world and some of the best quality. Oh, Spain. Spain is really good. True. Spain does it really well, but mm. Australia does a variant, like a very variance of it, of really old vines at really yep. good value. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And also you can get great Cote Rhone as well. Um, good Grenache. Everywhere, Still I think blends. it's like you, you you still get a decent amount of alcohol crash. Like you know, it ripens really, like it drops um, alcohol acid really quickly, and alcohol goes through the roof as you're growing it. So if you don't pick it um, early enough, it can be pretty high alcohol, like fourteen and a half percent, but still tastes pretty medium bodied. Um, and also like the the extract um, of colour and flavour. So this this here actually at the moment is, we're drinking Grenache. It's a Grenache that almost looks like a Pinot. Uh, Oh, it's I delicious, isn't it? I did not expect this to be a Grenache because I've heard Grenache. Grenache before, but, like, I've always thought, yeah, look, I didn't read the label, <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I was just drinking it. Um, so um, well, this is 14.5% alcohol, literally. So this Grenache is 14.5% alcohol. It has a myriad of different styles within it. It can be very heavily extracted. It can be very light and delicate. Mm -hmm. it can, it's even famous for some of the best rosés in the world. Um, Grenache sort of sits alongside these other, you know, amazing medium-bodied varieties. Sangiovese is, you know, right up there as Great. well. Great. Uh, is a really good example of really easy drinking fun. It can be very mm. serious. It can not be very serious. Syrah can do some not serious wines sometimes as well. Now, with with this one, uh, we're drinking this chilled. Yeah. Yep. Uh, 
What red wines should I... Like, can I chill a Pinot Noir okay. or should I just chill okay. uh, Grenache? Firstly, in Australia, this is more an Australian problem because than anywhere it's hot else. Here. But the vast majority of people drink their red wines way, way too, uh, way too warm and their white wines way too chilled. Yep. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So, so you want to most red wines, just in general, as a rule, should be slightly chilled than what ambient temperature is in Australia, in most places. Um, obviously, we're in Adelaide; it gets pretty damn cold here. So we're we're, we're we it's, get away it's with late it. June right now. We just hit winter solstice. It's fucking cold. Yeah, it was like negative four or five the other day in the hills. It was pretty bad. Um, uh, anyways, let's wrap it up. Yeah, look, that's been a lot of good wine chat. Again, uh, don't really care if we're recording this because I'm learning about a whole pile of red wine, which is pretty exciting. This Grenache is bloody excellent. Can't wait to drink more Tasty. of that. Tasty. Grenache. Keep that in mind, guys. Um, see, we, see you next week. We'll probably do some fortifieds. I don't know. We might some do some rosés. Or we can just oranges. do a bit of bubbly. Bit of bit of bubbly. Oh, yeah, bubbles. Yeah. We also need to do case wine. We also need to do cask wine as well. Anyway, again... Henry, Noah, Brendan, having a wonderful time drinking a few wines and finding out a few things. See you next time. Ciao.